Thank you, Dr. Serrano, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for, for being here today. It's been a, certainly a, a wonderful morning, and I've certainly learned more um, about um, the history of this institution than I ever realized uh, uh, before. Um, I thank um, uh, Dr. Frontera and especially uh, Dr. Silva for inviting me today to speak to you, and also, of course, Dr. Martinez, uh, who made it possible for me to spend uh, most of yesterday with the graduate students, uh, which was really a, a, a terrific occasion. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a new project we've been working on, uh, on a very old problem, uh, the problem of latency in malaria. Uh, uh, malaria is obviously a very uh, serious uh, illness. Uh, its name uh, comes from uh, 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 Italian for bad air. It was recognized that warm, swampy places uh, were associated with malaria. We now know that that's because it's spread by the bite of the female Anopheles mosquito, uh, but initially uh, uh, that wasn't fully worked out. Um, it's a huge problem. There are millions of people, uh, maybe actually probably billions of people at risk. There are uh, hundreds of millions of cases, um, over a million deaths a year. Um, that, those numbers are likely to be underestimates. Um, in fact, there was an article in the Times uh, just this, um, this week indicating that uh, the, uh, the death rates in India are probably much higher than had previously been uh, estimated. Uh, and in fact, a million children a year approximately in Africa uh, die of malaria each year. Um, uh, it is, uh, had been uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, probably in the days when this graduate program was relatively new, people were talking about eradication of malaria uh, with the advent of uh, chloroquine treatment and DDT. That seemed like it might be possible. Uh, as it turned out, the resistance of mosquitoes to DDT and the resistance of, uh, of the malaria to all known drugs has caused the, the idea of eradication to be abandoned until fairly recently when there is consideration of again uh, trying to address that. But it's obviously going to be a much harder problem than many other diseases, in part because of the uh, unusual uh, type of immunity from malaria where you don't have a situation uh, where uh, prior infection results in lifelong immunity. So unlike so many viral diseases, uh, probably a simple vaccination program uh, uh, will not um, eliminate the problem. Uh, malaria is uh, quite widespread. Here in the yellow regions we see the areas where malaria is currently endemic. Uh, Puerto Rico is no longer uh, one of those. Uh, however, the green area is the area where malaria can be transmitted, where the Anopheles mosquito lives and where malaria uh, did flourish, uh, even including where I come from in New Jersey. Uh, which had huge malaria epidemics up until the 1930s. Uh, and this eradication from these areas inside this green line is really only temporary. And in fact, even within the last decade, we've had uh, transmission of malaria in New Jersey, in California, and Texas, uh, when a traveler uh, with malaria comes in and gets bitten by a mosquito uh, and then transmits the disease locally. Fortunately, because the number of cases is so small, uh, those can then usually be eradicated relatively quickly, but, um, but still remains a potential threat. Now, the life cycle of malaria really explains a lot of the epidemiology and physiology of the disease. Uh, this life cycle, uh, as it's presented here, was basically worked out in 1948 when the final step of the cycle, the liver, the liver phase of the disease was understood. And by the time I was in medical school, uh, when this uh, uh, school was only in its first decade as a graduate program, uh, I learned this, this cycle and it was taught as something that was established and basically just part of the background uh, that you had to learn and it didn't seem like there was anything new there. So basically the it's a very complex life cycle for malaria, which cycles through two hosts. Its definitive host in which it undergoes sexual reproduction is the mosquito, and its intermediate host, uh, where it causes disease, 
is the human. And of course, there are other malarias that cause diseases in virtually all uh, vertebrate species that live on land. Um, the, when the female Anopheles mosquito takes a blood meal, if she's infected, uh, she injects sporozoites from her salivary glands along with anticoagulant. And those sporozoites initially are injected into the skin where a lot of them remain, which was just believed to be uh, you know, in inefficient injection of some sort. But a few of them would get into the bloodstream or the lymphatic system and within 30 minutes would invade a liver cell. In the liver cell, they could either uh, enter a latent state where they would just sit there like this for years or perhaps even decades. Uh, and that was true for two species of malaria that we'll talk about in a moment, Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale. And those could persist for a long time. But for the other types of malaria, uh, in fact, this did not happen. And they immediately began a massive uh, process of division uh, within the parasitophorous vacuole in this liver cell where they would cause no symptoms and no inflammation, but would amplify tremendously. And in the course of between one and a half and three weeks, would leave the liver cell as merozoites that could then invade red blood cells. Again, this liver, in some of the earlier books, it would, you might have seen descriptions of a liver cycle of malaria, but in fact, there is no liver cycle. The liver is a one-way street. Sporozoites go in and merozoites go out. They may persist in the latent state, but they never can reinvade the liver. Now, when the, the merozoites invade a red blood cell, they now begin a very rapid process of uh, merogamy in the red blood cell, where they divide to form between 10 and 26 uh, schizonts within a single red blood cell, which then lyses and uh, releases another cycle of uh, merozoites that can then invade another red blood cell. And this process keeps repeating and basically this is part of the, of the pathogenesis of the disease in that um, the patients then are undergoing a, a periodic hemolysis which will cause acute rounds of fever. This tends to get synchronized because the, it turns out that the, when these red cells lyse a lot of internal material from the red cell, including uh, both the red cell components that are normally intracellularly located and shielded from the immune system, as well as the parasite metabolic products, are now released into the circulation and exposed to the immune system. So there is a massive inflammatory and immune response to these materials, which causes fever. As it turns out, that fever both causes the symptoms of malaria and at the same time uh, turns out to be lethal to these intermediate forms of the organism. So that results in synchronization because the first merozoites that lice cause the fever and subsequently uh, they invade or now are the only surviving merozoites so that very rapidly this process gets synchronized so the patients have periodic bouts of fever ranging between every 24 hours to every 72 hours. Uh, and that those periodic fevers will continue until either the patient develops partial immunity, uh, which may suppress the infection down to a level of being asymptomatic, uh, or potentially could uh, eliminate it, although that may not be very efficient, or until the patient is treated with some drug. Uh, once immunity begins to develop and the situation for the parasites is less desirable. They have the ability to also undergo sexual differentiation and now will form the male and female gamonts uh, in infected red blood cells, which are now the form infectious for the mosquito. So when the mosquito takes a blood meal, the only malaria cells that can invade the mosquito are these uh, uh, gametocytes, which then uh, undergo sexual reproduction in the gut of the mosquito to form the zygote or oocinete that migrates through the wall of the intestine, uh, enters the salivary gland where they differentiate into the sporozoites that now get reinjected.
So that explains a lot about malaria. Uh, but one question that remains unanswered is how does malaria persist? We, now, we know now that some forms of malaria, such as Plasmodium malariae, can last for as long as 50 years in asymptomatic patients who have not traveled to regions where they can be infected by malaria. Yet the liver phase of the uh, Plasmodium malariae infection only lasts for three weeks. So no one really understands how that persistence occurs in this and other species, except for the two species that have the liver latency form. And here you can see a picture of red blood cells um, infected uh, with malaria parasites. And um, in fact, the parasites are living in a topological niche that's very interesting because it's actually an invagination of membrane as they invade the, either the liver cell or the red blood cell where the cellular membrane is invaginated by the invading parasite which is now living in a parasitophorous vacuole um, inside the cell and in fact these parasites metabolize hemoglobin to make uh, toxic uh, hemozoan uh, and uh, that's how they uh, survive inside these cells. The, there are, are five forms of malaria parasites that invade humans and cause disease. Uh, Plasmodium vivax uh, uses the Duffy antigen or dark protein, which is actually a chemokine receptor on erythrocytes as its target. It has latency in the liver. Uh, it prefers reticulocytes. It's not culturable and has a 48 hour uh, life cycle. Plasmodium ovale is very similar to Plasmodium vivax, but it uses a different receptor. Uh, Plasmodium falciparum, in fact, is the most lethal of the malarias. Uh, it's lethal for um, two reasons. One is that unlike the other forms of malaria that we just talked about that prefer reticulocytes, uh, Plasmodium falciparum will invade all red blood cells and in fact uh, you can get parasitemias of greater than 50%. So when a person is infected with this organism, they may uh, have all of a sudden more than half of their red blood cells lice, resulting in a, a tremendous um, uh, hemolysis, uh, renal disease, renal uh, damage, uh, anemia, and anoxic damage. But even more damaging is the fact that the uh, parasite encodes a protein that migrates to the external surface of the infected uh, red blood cells and causes those infected red blood cells now to stick to the, the endothelial cells that line the capillaries and various organs. So patients infected with this organism will now have infarcts of their heart and lung and kidney uh, brain uh, and that is, that is one of the few infectious diseases where a patient can walk into the doctor's office not feeling well and be dead in a matter of hours unless there's adequate treatment. Uh, here the cycle is 48 hours and again there's no liver persistence uh, uh, and this is the first organism for which in fact the, uh, uh, the, the uh, organism can be cultured in cultured red blood cells. In fact, Dr. Serrano is one of the experts at doing that. Uh, now here's Plasmodium malariae is a relatively mild but long lasting infection. It has a 72 hour life cycle. It has no liver persistence, but as I say, very long infections. Uh, and it also is not culturable. Uh, and then there's Plasmodium nolzi, which had been known for many years as an infection of uh, various monkey species in Southeast Asia is now recognized also as a human pathogen. Uh, its genome is closely related to Plasmodium vivax and it also uses the dark receptor that vivax uses. It has only a 24 hour life cycle and it is culturable and easy to genetically manipulate. Uh, and it also has uh, no liver persistence. Uh, malaria and humans have been coexisting for millennia and we have, had, uh, we have had our genetics impacted by the selection by the malaria infections and malaria has altered its genetics to circumvent our defense mechanisms. 
So here you see a map of Africa showing the regions where uh, malaria is endemic, and here you see the frequency of two mutations, which in humans are, are quite deleterious in the homozygous form, but in heterozygous form result in resistance to malaria and therefore are positively selected. One is the presence of a hemoglobin S, where a heterozygote is, has a relatively mild symptoms, although uh, homozygotes have disastrous sickle cell anemia. And then you have the thalassemias that, in fact, uh, cause um, a, uh, a, a, an inefficiency in production of hemoglobin, which in the homozygous form can be quite lethal, but in heterozygous form will cause relatively mild disease and, and resistance to malaria. Again, this resistance is probably mainly due to the fact that when there are defects in hemoglobin structure or synthesis, you have a persistence of fetal hemoglobin, and in fact, red blood cells that contain fetal hemoglobin are relatively resistant to malaria, so the people who are heterozygous for these infections, in fact, are resistant uh, to the organism. Now, there are other examples of this coevolution. So, for example, remember I told you that two of the species of malaria, Plasmodium nolzi and Plasmodium vivax, uh, use the dark protein on the red blood cell surface as the receptors to which they bind when they invade the red blood cell. Now, as it turns out, Plasmodium vivax is found throughout the world except in the western part of Africa. Because in the western part of Africa, other than the Europeans who immigrated there, uh, most of the population uh, is negative for the Duffy blood group substance in that they have a promoter mutation in the precursors of their red blood cells which causes them not to make the Duffy protein on the red blood cells, although in fact they still uh, use a different promoter to make uh, the dark protein uh, on their other cells, including the endothelial cells that line their blood vessels. So since that part of West Africa has uh, a, a population that is a relatively poor host for Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium vivax doesn't exist there, but that is the only region in the world where you have a very high incidence of infection of Plasmodium ovale, which appears to have originated as a mutant of Plasmodium vivax, which closely resembles the parent species, but which now utilizes a different receptor on the red blood cell. So here we see an example of how the malaria has evolved uh, to evade uh, host defenses. Now, just want to go over a paper now, which was recently published, in fact, was recently published online, will shortly be coming out uh, in, um, in press. Um, so let's go back if we can. Uh, and that relates to uh, the infectivity uh, of sporozoites when they get in injected into the skin of the host by the mosquito. Now, as we all learned, even when I was in medical school, a lot of those sporite, sporozoites remain in the skin uh, but, in fact, uh, we were just taught, well, that's just inefficient processing of those, of those sporozoites. The important ones are the ones that get into the liver. As it turns out, that may not really be the case. And a lot of what we learned about that life cycle may not really be correct. Uh, studying Plasmodium burgii, which is a, uh, a rodent uh, malaria, in fact, also studied by Dr. Serrano, uh, and, in fact, using Plasmodium burgii that had been genetically engineered to express GFP, uh, you know, it was studied in hairless mice where you could really look at the skin infection, and it was determined that the parasite, in fact, does really develop in the skin. It is not simply left there as a byproduct of infection. Okay. So here's the paper we're talking about. It's from... Uh, uh, Menard and co-workers, and they indeed showed that the malaria parasite does develop in the skin. So here is basically the data they have. What they did is they um, either had mosquitoes bite the ears, infected mosquitoes, bearing the GFP uh, uh, labeled parasites, either bite the ears of the hairless mice, or they could inject um, the skin uh, with the sporozoites. And what happened is, as was known previously, uh, at the, initially they found, in fact, 
uh, that there were a lot of sporozoites in the skin. Uh, and it was known that those sporozoites would no longer be formed, would no longer be seen there later. But what they did then is they looked at subsequent days, day one, day two, day three, and day four, and in fact, what they found now in the skin of these mice uh, was um, developing forms of the parasite uh, that, were that could be recognized because they could both see them morphologically and they were expressing in a parasitophorous vacuole the green fluorescent protein. And, um, and in fact, when they quantified the, uh, the growth of these extra erythrocytic forms in terms of the size of the vacuoles, in fact, the growth of those vacuoles in the liver was exactly parallel to the growth in the skin, uh, whether the, the sporozoites were injected uh, by the mosquito or by the experimenter. And in fact, here you can see an example of that, where here you can see the parasite in the skin in the parasitophorous vacuole, and here you see an antibody against a uh, protein uh, which is known to be in the uh, membrane that surrounds the parasitophorous vacuole. So you can see, that, and this is exactly what these things would look like in the liver, uh, but these are in the skin. So, okay, now we see that, in fact, development can occur in the skin. Now the question is, is that relevant at all to infection, or is this a dead end? And until this paper came out, everyone would have said, well, that's probably just not interesting. That's a dead end. Well, as it turns out, what you can do, and this was, I think, a very clever biological experiment, is uh, you can, what they did is they took the skin cells from these sporozoite-infected mice, and at one day, they excised the infected cells and purified them. And that, at one day, the liver forms had not yet matured and released their merozoites. They grew these in culture for three days and then injected those cells intravenous into naive mice. And the mice, in fact, uh, developed parasitemia. So what they had shown here is that, in fact, the skin cells can be infected and the skin cells can produce parasites that are capable of infecting red blood cells. So we really have to go back. So here is this wonderful life cycle of malaria, which we've all known since the 1940s. And it turns out that, that it is, there are alternative pathways. So looking at that, that raises the issue of might there be alternative pathways in other parts of the, of the life cycle. So our idea basically uh, was uh, to look for where the latency might, might be outside the liver in those long-term infections and strains of malaria that do not have liver persistence. Now, our model uh, is that that may occur in endothelial cells. We haven't proved that yet, but we are working on that and we're certainly hopeful. How do we come up with such a strange model? Well, first of all, it turns out that in reptiles and birds, that does happen. The malaria parasites that leave the red blood cell have the potential of invading endothelial cells and causing a form called the phenerozoite, which can be productive and produce more merozoites that can then go back and invade red blood cells, or where latency can occur, and in fact, the parasite can persist for the life of the host organism. It's also important that endothelial cells are developmentally related to the precursors of the, of the red blood cells. And in fact, in embryology, the erythroblasts develop from endothelial cells from the dorsal vein in the early embryo. So there is a common pathway here. And in fact, the endothelial cells do express the, uh, the dark receptor for malaria, uh, even in fact in dark negative patients. So we proposed that we could look for uh, infection of these endothelial cells by the cultured parasites as a way of uh, testing this hypothesis, and we are currently working on that. Uh, here is a photograph I took of some uh, material generously provided by Sam Telford. This is a, a section from the uh, exterior of the heart from, from the pericardium, and here you can see 
uh, some phenerozoites uh, in the reptile um, heart tissue. And uh, that's the, what, that is the stage that we're looking for now in our system. So our basic model is that the, in addition to having these, the two pathways which merozoites can go in is that they can either perpetuate the red blood cell cycle or can develop into gametocytes uh, that they may have the possibility of in fact becoming phenerozoites in endothelial cells and persisting there. So far what we've been how we've been working on this is we've uh, cultured the endothelial cells, we've solved the problem that cultured endothelial cells tend to lose expression of the dark antigen. It turns out we can induce that antigen by, uh, with a tumor necrosis factor alpha, and we've uh, managed now to, uh, with the help of a number of people, including the, the advice of Dr. Serrano, uh, have uh, got the cultures going of the plasmodium nolzi and plasmodium falciparum of the only two species that can be cultured. So we are hoping to soon uh, have some results but I thought it was fun in the context of this historical event to talk about this problem because I think it's a good thing for the students to see that even well-established truths that we've received for decades uh, need to be tested. And very often there's new things to be found in, even in subjects which it's thought are just that old stuff that we have to learn before we go to do screening our microarrays. So I'd like to thank my collaborators who've been helping us with this work, especially uh, my postdoctoral fellow, Chris Utter, uh, graduate student Anna Rodriguez, who's been working with him, and my collaborator in the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, John Glaude, who's an expert on the culture of endothelial cells. Thank you very much. <laughs>